Welcome to the Daily Report. It's Wednesday, January 5th here in Korea. A local court has exempted private academic facilities from the government's vaccine pass mandate. We have details up next after a check on the global tallies. I have Kwon Soa standing by. So, do start us off. Sunny, as it is a Wednesday, as we usually see an uptick in infections from the past few days due to the weekend factor, we are seeing an increase in cases. Uh, the number stands at 4,444 as of 12 a.m. And that includes 4,233 domestic infections as well as 211 imported cases. So quite a jump here in cases from abroad as well. Now, almost all provinces or major cities in the country have have seen a rebound in the past day, including Seoul and Gyeonggi-do province, which are back to over 1,000 cases. Uh, meanwhile, here, um, Jeollabuk-do province, with 97 new infections, has now surpassed 10,000 cases uh, for its total caseload. And if we go over to our graph, uh, we are seeing here quite a jump from the day before, around 1,400 more cases uh, from Tuesday, but also it is uh, almost uh, 1,000 fewer cases than Wednesday a week ago. Uh, meanwhile, Korea has reported 57 additional fatalities, which has raised the death toll to 5,838. And uh, the country's total caseload is approaching 650,000. Now let's move on to the number of uh, patients that remain in severe or critical condition. Uh, there's been a decline here from the day before and also uh, 953. This is the lowest number in roughly three weeks. Let's move over to our vaccination figures. So we've got around 26,300 people who received their first shot a day ago and some 54,300 uh, that got their second one. And on the booster shot front, uh, we've got more than 351,000 people who received that additional dose yesterday and that's now 19.3 million people. Going over to the international figures, the total number of COVID-19 cases around the world stands at over 295.5 million with some 5.47 million uh, COVID-19 related deaths. And uh, moving over to the accumulated caseloads in some countries here, the U.S. has hit 58 million, India 35 million in the past day. Uh, meanwhile, France here has surpassed the total caseload of Russia in the past day, while we've also got Mexico here, which has hit the 4 million milestone in the past day. And uh, those are the general updates that I have for now, but I'll see you back in a bit. Sunny? All right, so uh, thank you for now. Right, as I mentioned at the start of the program, an administrative court here in Seoul has blocked the requirement of vaccine passes at private academic venues. For more, Choi Minjong joins me now. Minjong, welcome back. Thank you for having me, Sunny. Right, so how are authorities here responding to this legal setback? Right, Sunny, the court decision is just the latest in a series of pushbacks against the government's new vaccine pass requirements. To suit the public, Korean health authorities held a meeting on Wednesday morning and vowed to minimize any disruptions that may arise from the use of vaccine passes. Let's take a listen to what they said. The government introduced the vaccine pass policy last November in a bid to protect the unvaccinated, curb the spread of the virus and secure adequate medical capacity. We will try to relieve any discomfort that may arise regarding the passes in the future. Right, and that is the stance of the government then. Min Jung, do tell us a bit about the legal basis behind the court's decision. Right. It was the court's decision that the new rules were infringing on the right to learn for the unvaccinated. Since early December, the government had imposed vaccine mandates at private academies and study cafes to tackle the rising number of student infections and to encourage vaccine uptake. But this latest court ruling is the first ever decision by the country's judiciary to apply the breaks on the government's vaccination policy. This also comes amid the growing backlash from parents and the, in the academic area, with a number of petitions being filed to the Blue House. The court says it is difficult to say that the unvaccinated pose a higher risk to places of learning, considering the number of breakthrough infections among vaccinated people. And following the decision, the government expressed regret and said it will appeal the ruling. Officials stress that the vaccine pass is needed to protect the unvaccinated who are more likely to fall seriously ill after contracting COVID-19. But for the time being, the adoption of vaccine passes at places of learning will be put on hold pending further court proceedings.
Right. And what looks to be the implication of this latest ruling for teenagers themselves? Right, Sunny, this court ruling will indeed be important for teenagers in South Korea. The government plans to expand its vaccine pass mandates to teenagers starting March, which means they will not be able to study at places of learning without being vaccinated or submitting a negative PCR test. Once we have a final ruling on the vaccine pass mandate, it will ultimately decide whether or not this measure will be implemented. The idea was to counter the rising number of infections among teenagers, but the court decision also took into account the fact that children are less likely to become seriously ill or die from COVID-19 when compared to adults. Meanwhile, the vaccination rate among teenagers has risen with the government's decision to implement the passes. More than half of those aged 12 to 17 are now fully vaccinated, but we'll have to see what impact the ruling will have on the vaccination rates. Right. Minjo, meanwhile, I hear health authorities have also addressed public doubts about the necessity of current restrictions. You're right, Sunny. And there have also been claims that natural immunity is, um, provides more protection than vaccinations. And regarding this, the government on Tuesday said there is no available data suggesting this and explained that natural immunity is relatively weaker, especially when symptoms are mild. The government also reiterated the importance of social distancing measures, showing data that found mask wearing is only 10 to 50 percent effective in preventing transmissions and therefore close contact has to be avoided. All right, I see Minjung. Thank you for now. Stay with us for more talks. Thank you. Right, and staying with remarks by health authorities here, I have saw at the desk with more from Wednesday's morning briefing, that is, on COVID-19, which reportedly placed priority on the need for vaccine passes. Quite a bit of emphasis there, Soa. Tell us more. Right, Sunny. So the briefing was really concentrated on explaining the need for the vaccination verification system following the court ruling on suspending the vaccine pass mandate at cram schools and other places of learning. So let's start off with this comment from an official at the health ministry. The purpose of adopting vaccine passes goes beyond simply raising our vaccination rates. It is aimed at protecting the unvaccinated by minimizing their risk of infection and thereby hospitalizations, while also helping to get our gradual transition to normal back on track by easing the strain on our medical capacity. Restoring a sense of normality remains our ultimate goal that we can never forfeit once our vaccination rate has reached a sufficient level. Right, and keeping that in mind, I suppose then the government's concern right now, Soa, is that calls for vaccine pass exemptions might spread. Right, Sonny. We talked about uh, demonstrations in other countries like in Europe where citizens have been even more vocal uh, about these vaccine passes. And that is also why the government official in the briefing earlier took notice of the fact that such systems have been introduced across the world. And it is the primary method to prevent the virus from spreading and essential in countries that have adopted a so-called living with COVID-19 system, which does not focus on strong social distancing measures. Authorities are currently ruling out the possibility of expanding the suspension of the system at other venues and are also looking for ways to prevent rising infections among teenagers as the latest developments may slow the momentum of our vaccination drive among those who have not yet been vaccinated. So related ministries are in discussion of temporarily strengthening prevention rules at places like cram schools and study rooms, such as having uh, allowing one person per three school square meters, measures that had been scrapped after the vaccine pass system was introduced. I see. Now, I hear the academic authorities themselves have also renewed calls for teenage vaccination. So I'll tell us more. Yes, Sunny. So Education Minister Yu Eun-hye has appealed to teenagers to get vaccinated regardless of the suspension of the vaccine pass mandate at uh, study venues. Uh, and uh, she stressed that the Education Ministry uh, will support teenagers uh, for any possible adverse reactions after getting vaccinated. And uh, she also reiterated the ministry's continued continuous provision of information that shows that there are more benefits than uh, risks. Uh, those uh, informations, of course, given to the parents as well. Right. One more question about the local front. So Korea, I understand, has secured more vaccine doses. Right. Uh, just briefly, a total of 150.4 million doses have been secured for this year, and that includes some 70.4 million, which were unused from last year. I see. Right then, beyond Korea, Minjong, I hear fresh highs in daily tallies. Are recorded over in Europe. 
That's right, Sunny. Countries in Europe are seeing never-before-seen uh, levels of daily infections. France reported another record of over 271,000 new cases on Tuesday, and this is by far the highest daily tally witnessed since the onset of the pandemic. Tuesday also marked the first time that the UK logged over 200,000 new infections. Germany is also grappling with the Omicron variant, as it has now become a dominant strain in the capital, Berlin. According to health authorities there, the number of daily infections have tripled in a one-week span. The U.S. also passed a grim milestone with the country's daily tally topping 1 million on Monday. This comes as the U.S. CDC estimated that the Omicron variant now accounts for 95 percent of all cases there, according to an anal analysis of test samples from the past week. Right, and that is over in the U.S. Now, meanwhile, so the global health body has shared some rather favorable findings about Omicron. Right, Sunny, the World Health Organization sees more evidence uh, that the variant causes milder symptoms than other strains. Uh, one official said more studies note that Omicron infects the upper part of the body, uh, unlike other variants that attack the lungs that can also cause severe pneumonia, for instance. Still, more studies are required to prove that, according to WHO. O incident manager Abdi Mahamud. And uh, another positive development is uh, that uh, figures from South Africa show that vaccines uh, did show protection against the Omicron variant in the past weeks and months against uh, hospitalization, severe illness, as well as death. Now, what the WHO also had to mention was regarding this new uh, variant that was detected in France, which we talked about yesterday, that's said to have 46 mutations. Regarding that, an official said that the World Health Body actually had this variant on their radar. And uh, so they downplayed the threats posed by this new variant because uh, it already had enough time to spread, but it hasn't. I see. Well, that is good to know. Back in the U.S., Minjung, I understand the booster shot interval has been reduced to about a month. Right, the By US, month, that is. Right, the U.S. Um, CDC has given the green light to shorten interval for Pfizer booster shots. Um, the agency on Tuesday narrowed the gap between the second and third shots from six to five months. However, people who have received the Moderna vaccine must still wait for six months and two months for those who got the Janssen jab. The CDC also recommended booster shots for children aged 5 to 11 with weak immune systems. Its advisory panel is set to review the FDA's recommendation on administering booster shots to teenagers aged 12 to 15 on Wednesday. And uh, along with the new guidelines uh, for Pfizer's vaccine, the U.S. is also speeding up the delivery of the uh, drug maker's oral antiviral treatment Paxlovid. Uh, U.S. President Joe Biden on uh, Tuesday said an additional 10 million courses of the treatment will be purchased, doubling the government's earlier order. Biden expressed hopes for these pills to dramatically decrease COVID-19 hospitalizations and deaths and called them a game changer with the potential to, quote, dramatically alter the impact of COVID-19. Pfizer, in a statement, said the delivery of the first 10 million courses will be accelerated to the end of June, with the remaining 10 million to be shipped until the end of September. Now, this is good news for Americans, uh, but uh, this is also raising concerns that the gap between uh, the haves and haves not just like we have seen with uh, vaccination, could repeat itself with oral treatment as well. Now, now, uh, Korea for now has a deal with Pfizer and Merck uh, to provide uh, pills for some 600,000 people here in the nation. But there are concerns that mass buying in the U.S. now may affect us and other countries for our further purchases in the future. Right. Well, hopefully that will not be the case. All right. So as always, thank you very much for the latest on the pandemic front. And Min Jong, thank you. See you on Thursday. Thank you. In other news, following last year's fully virtual event, the annual Consumer Electronics Show this year has an in-person component. Our Moon Ganyang, who is currently in Las Vegas, files this report. Las Vegas. The glitz, glamour and the bright lights that define the world-famous entertainment capital of the world are back. The neon-lit strip is again seeing traffic build up and tourists are coming in droves. 
Vegas returned to some resemblance of normal after a months-long COVID-19-led hiatus also means the return of the annual tech pilgrimage to a trade show called the Consumer Electronics Show. And with CES, of course, comes the CES Unveiled, one of the most popular pre-CES events leading up to the Consumer Electronics Show. Now, normally, you see journalists queued up here to get into this event, but this year, it's a little different. Many tech companies and media made last-minute decisions to pull out of in-person presence this year due to a surge in Omicron cases, but it's not stopping the organizers from marching ahead with a trade show. Requiring everybody to be vaccinated was, you know, one decision that we knew was going to help us, um, you know, help us no matter kind of what was happening down the road. Then uh, being able to offer free testing to everybody that came, that was like another layer that was important for us masking and requiring people to continue to wear masks. These are the things that are going to help us get through and move forward. And so it was important for us to continue to move forward, uh, you know, especially because we had 2,200 companies really counting on us to bring everybody together and, and do this this year live. So what are some of the key tech trends to watch in an unusual year that is 2022? I think AI is one of them that we keep seeing, driverless technologies, electric technologies, and I think probably health is probably probably the, the four ones that you'll see. But then, you know, the other exciting things that we have this year for the first time is like we have space technology. AI, food tech and health tech with a sprinkling of metaverse and NFTs. Well, another key word here at CES 2022 is health tech and health care combined with digital technology. Here we have a massage chair. I think a lot of Koreans have, must have one or two massage chairs at home. Um, let's meet with the CEO of uh, this firm. Hello there. Hi, hello, welcome to our booth. You have an option to, you can take it off shoes. Like... So let me try it out. Sure, yeah. So is that the element where AI comes in? Yes, so the AI, we use a two uh, types of AI What we use. We use the neighbor systems, the voice recognition. Also, we collect our data from your uh, signals and we analyze uh, based on what uh, time that they use, what kind of function that they use. And also, we measure uh, some of those bio signals from your body and we identify, detect, and then let you know that what's your health conditions. So identifying my health conditions and providing me with oxygen, yes. um, absorbing nitrogen. So this is uh, at-home health care. The increased focus on wellness following the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated the digital transformation of health care and skyrocketing demands for mobile and flexible care solutions are being met with pioneering technology. And another key word at this year's CES is the future of mobility and autonomous driving. Here I have Indy Autonomous Challenge and uh, let's meet Paul. Hi, hello there. Hello. Now uh, this, you have a race car here. So tell me all about it. This is a fully autonomous, meaning self-driving race car. It's capable of traveling at 160 miles an hour around the racetrack and it does so without any human telling it what to do. Right, so uh, this will be racing around the racetrack, competing with one another this week. So at least two cars passing each other at the higher and higher speeds. It's, it's never been done in the world and it's going to advance the state of the art in autonomous technology. So what's the technology behind this? So this vehicle, if you look at it, it looks like any other race car, except where the driver sits is filled with advanced uh, autonomous technology. We have perception systems like LIDAR, radar, uh, optical sensors. It's one thing to think about it as an autonomous race car, but think of those times when an ambulance needs to try to get through traffic very fast to save a life. That's where this technology can be applied to better our daily lives. The three-day show, cut back from an initial four-day run, opens on Wednesday at venues across Las Vegas and is being offered virtually. While it may be a subdued gathering this year, it will nonetheless serve as a platform to display groundbreaking tech accelerating the digital transformation. And in 2022, what happens in Vegas don't just stay in Vegas. Moon Gonyo, Arirang News, Las Vegas.
Meanwhile, interest this year in Korea's upcoming presidential election appears to be relatively low among eligible voters abroad. Our Kim Do-yeon has more on this reality. There are only three days to go until the closure of registration for overseas and absentee voters, those outside the country during the election period in South Korea. As of Wednesday morning, around 175,000 voters across the world had signed up, merely around 7.5% of what the government believes are eligible voters overseas. The registration is currently ongoing and many people are putting in efforts to promote more registrations, but the rate is low. There must be many reasons, but voters overseas need to take more interest in the election and sign up. Mr. Kwok and other South Koreans in New Zealand have started a website to tackle the low sign-up rate. The website includes a competition that local residents can participate in with a prize raffle at the end. Businesses ranging from restaurants to grocery stores have donated vouchers for their stores to attract more participants. Across the globe, in Europe, Ms. Jung Sun Gyeong, who has been vocal about social issues pertaining to South Korea on the global stage, had an experience that pushed her to promote overseas voting, especially the registration part. I was walking up slowly to the polling station and someone cut the line to vote. But he ended up not being able to vote because he didn't know he had to sign up to vote before the actual election period. Despite the efforts, sign-up rates are disappointing, especially compared to five years ago for the previous presidential election. But representatives aren't losing hope and are sharing the daily numbers of new registrations with each other. Out in Oman, where South Koreans have to keep their citizenship as local law doesn't give citizenship to immigrants, some even still pay taxes to South Korea. Mr. Kim jong says it's a right that needs to be maintained. It's a bit disappointing because we need to keep our right to vote through participation, as the right to vote was earned through hard work and with the help of South Korean lawmakers. But I heard the general consensus at the moment is that it's a waste of money considering only 10% of eligible voters sign up. Another aspect that doesn't help overseas voters is that many have to travel, sometimes thousands of kilometers, to get to a polling booth. However, representatives all say for more improvements to be made, a high rate of registration and actual participation is required. Kim do Arirang News. Let's take a look at what's going on in the world now. Israel is now allowing same-sex couples and single men to become parents through surrogacy within the country, upholding a Supreme Court ruling to end the ban on Tuesday. Calling it a historic day for the LGBTQ struggle in Israel, the country's health minister announced the lifting of restrictions, granting equal access for all to surrogate pregnancy. The move comes as Israel's LGBTQ community had for years demanded to be allowed to pursue surrogacy, which is already available for heterosexual couples as well as single women. The nation's Supreme Court last July ruled that the surrogacy ban for same-sex couples and single men violated their rights and called for the lifting of the ban within six months. The rule will come into effect starting January 11th. Chinese President Xi Jinping on Tuesday inspected preparations for the upcoming 2022 Beijing Winter Olympic and Paralympic Games. Xi visited venues such as the National Speed Skating Oval, the main media center, and the Athletes' Village. However, while the Chinese president is often seen without a mask to show China's quarantine achievements during official visits, he was seen wearing a mask during this recent visit. Pundits say Xi wearing a face mask this time is a move to show that China is following a strict COVID-19 prevention policy in preparation for the international sporting event. During his visit, Xi also extended New Year greetings to athletes, coaches, volunteers and other staff members for the Winter Games. All across Europe, tattoo artists on Tuesday protested an EU ban that came into force, limiting the use of thousands of chemicals, effectively banning many of the most widely used inks. According to the EU, the chemicals are hazardous, with some linked to cancer, reproductive difficulties and skin irritations. Certain chemicals contained in the two ink can uh, pose danger for the human health. So the Commission has adopted restriction of certain dangerous chemicals 
which are contained in uh, mixtures of the two ink. Uh, and those chemicals can be cancerogenic, mutagenic, uh, reprotoxic or cause allergies uh, to the skin. So they could really harm uh, the citizens. However, tattoo artists say alternatives to the inks do not yet exist or are in short supply, dealing a massive blow to an industry that has already been hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. The European Commission argues that manufacturers and artists had a year from when the rules were adopted to prepare for the changes, adding alternative inks do exist. Lee seung Arirang News. Webtoons are digital comics that began in Korea about 20 years ago, and the ongoing pandemic appears to have offered them a greater platform. Do take a look. From Hellbound to DP, South Korean dramas that have gained global popularity have something in common, and that is those well-made TV series are based on webtoons. South Korean webtoons have emerged as a new star of the Hallyu wave, and with that, the webtoon industry has witnessed its steady growth. So what exactly about webtoons are so appealing to its viewers? Let's find out more. Hellbound, a South Korean drama released in November last year, ranked first on the world's largest OTT platform. Such success led to more interest in its original webtoon. After the drama was released, the average number of weekly views of the original webtoon increased by about 22 times, and the average number of weekly payments also increased by about 14 times. As dramas made based on webtoons achieved much success across the world, Korean webtoons also have gained attention and interest. Content's힘인 것 같습니다. 한국 웹툰의 콘텐츠는 어 초기에는 로맨스나 판타지들이 그 많은 외국 독자들의 공감대를 가졌습니다만 최근에 보면은 뭐 스위트홈, 지옥, 뭐 DP 이런 the South Korean webtoon market is enjoying steady popularity. In 2020, the webtoon industry saw its combined sales top over 1 trillion Korean won for the first time. And this also marks a 65% increase compared to 2019. And experts explain that COVID-19 played a significant role in the growth of the webtoon industry. Korean webtoons are now recognized on the global stage. This data released by Big Portal site shows the increasing trend of global webtoon fans. Also, by looking at the number of downloads for webtoon apps, we can learn how popular South Korean webtoons are. In 2014, Naver and other platforms started to the with the growing popularity of Korean webtoons across the globe, webtoon platforms and agencies now target overseas markets. Overseas markets. 
판타지, 좀 액션 이런 장르가 좀 크게 히트를 칠수 있습니다. 중국이라면 그 문화적인 어떤 특성도 좀 고려해야 되는데요. 심의 문제 같은 게 있을 수 있습니다. 아, 이런 문제도 좀 세밀하게 들여다보면서 아, 작품을 준비하고 있습니다. Meanwhile, there are some big challenges that could stand in the way of Webtoon's growth, and these include illegal sharing and posting of Webtoons. Webtoon이 해외에서 인기다 보니까 불법으로 유통되는 게 굉장히 심합니다. 어, 우리가 영어 서비스를 올리면 24시간이 걸리지 않아서 어, 영어로 된 불법 유통물이 어, 플랫폼에 버젓이 올라가게 됩니다. 어, 이런 웹툰의 해외 불법 운영에 대해서는 같이 좀 신경을 써서 힘을 모아서 어, 좀 단속을 해야 될 걸로 봅니다. It is also necessary to seek ways to grow further without being complacent with the current popularity. 과연 웹툰의 미래는 뭘까? 넥스트 웹툰은 뭘까라는 고민들을 많이 했습니다. 그래서 이제 그동안 고민했던 게 VR, AR, 뭐 무빙툰 그래서 웹툰을 다양하게 좀 변화를 주는 시도들 이런 시도들을 해왔습니다. 이 기술적 시도들도 좀 많이 해왔는데 결국 한국 웹툰의 핵심은 콘텐츠에 있다 이렇게 볼수 있을 것 같습니다. 더 깊이 있는 내용과 콘텐츠를 가지고 고민들을 해나가야 될것 같고요. Apparently, South Korean webtoon is enjoying its new height of popularity and, of course, gaining global recognition. And now all eyes are on how far this newly emerging cultural content powerhouse will grow in the coming days. This has been Shin s e b y e o n Omicron continues to challenge containment efforts across the globe and some pundits are calling for changes in COVID-19 strategies to better address this new variant. For more, I have Dr. Kim Sung-tek from Institute Pasteur Korea. Dr. Kim, welcome back. It's good to see you. Good afternoon. And I have Dr. Alice h y u n g y o n g Tan at Ms. Medi Women's Hospital live on the line. Dr. Tan, it's also good to see you too. Thank you for having me. Right. Also joining the session virtually is Dr. Cristobal Belda at Carlos III Health Institute in Spain. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Dr. Belda. Right. Thank you. Good morning. Right. Good morning there. It's good afternoon here, though. Uh, Dr. Kim, we'll start here in the studio. Health authorities worldwide say the spread of Omicron is by far outpacing containment efforts. Do you agree? Well, I think so. I mean, just uh, based on the, uh, some uh, features of the, uh, the, this uh, specific bar bar variant, I think uh, this is kind of a just worrisome just a feature. But uh, uh, whenever we just uh, uh, hear about some uh, just a new variant of this SARS coronavirus 2, then we actually uh, consider two different aspects of the, the virus. So one is the, uh, some how just uh, efficiently the virus is actually transmitted. And the second one is uh, how severe disease this variant can cause. And then for the transmissibility, I mean, somehow just a uh, sort of just a consensus among the old experts is that now this virus seems to spread very well. So that's why the, uh, this virus seems to be more fit and then probably just, uh, just a predominant will become a, some a dominant uh, just a variant over the some at least the next uh, some couple, of, couple of months. And then for the severity issues, there was actually some, uh, some uh, complicating just uh, some factors, whether before we can say just whether this causes a severe disease or not, because uh, some, of the, some, uh, some of the clinical data we actually obtained from, for example, like uh, South Africa and the European countries, because uh, those data is actually just a uh, very complex, because uh, in the case of South Africa, most of the patients actually uh, some uh, some pre previous so SARS coronavirus to infection. So some natural immunity can just actually just a, just a complicating the interpretation of the some current data. And, uh, and also for some uh, European countries, many people are already just vaccinated, but then they have actually experienced the breakthrough infection. In that case, the vaccinated people, that immunity by the vaccination maybe just make it just very difficult to just interpret 
such data, so then we cannot actually say e easily say that uh, whether this is the, the, uh, the Omicron variant is actually causing very severe disease or not. But then the more data is like, accumulating, and uh, very recent uh, some uh, preclinical data, especially from the uh, some uh, animal uh, animal data from uh, mouse experiments and then hamster experiment that shows that uh, uh, this uh, the virus actually seems to so replicate less efficiently in the lung, and also just a pneumonia is actually just less uh, less well observed in these mouse models as well. And also, most of the infection seems to occur in the upper respiratory tract, which I think are probably just a maybe good sign. So, growing evidence seems to just indicate the uh, this Omicron variant maybe just cause a relatively just a mild disease compared to some uh, prior just a variant concern. But we have to be very careful before just uh, jumping onto a very, just a very any uh, hasty just conclusion because uh, if, if, if even there's maybe just severity and the fatality rate may be just low, but if the, uh, the total number of cases is growing, then, then maybe even with the uh, very low just the case fatality rate, we, we might just uh, see a lot of just uh, just the uh, patient just uh, suffering from a severe disease and also even from death. Right, perhaps yeah. owing to complications then. Mm -hmm. Dr. Belder, over in Spain, I believe Omicron has pushed the daily tally to above, well above 100,000 cases in recent days. What more can you tell us about the situation in Spain? Okay, um, the, the current situation in Spain is that yesterday we have diagnosed 120,000 new cases. So, uh, in this case, we are observing an increase in the number of infection after the since the first week of uh, December, with the entry of this uh, of this Omicron uh, variant, and we are experiencing uh, a few days later what had happened in the rest of the European of the European continent. Uh, regarding hospitalization, we are observing a, a proportional increase uh, in the uh, number of patients that has been admitted in our hospital all over Spain. In this regard, what we are observing, and that's what has been commented here, is that um, we are detecting some differences in the hospitalization compared with previous waves. As there are many patients that are admitted in the hospital with a positive test, but who have come to the hospital to be treated for another pathology. This combination of patient in the hospital with the virus and patient admitted in the hospital because of the virus is generating some confusion about the conversion rate between the SARS-CoV-2 infection and the hospitalization. In this regard, uh, we have to be very patient in, in calculating the clinical impact of this new variant on our hospitals. I see. And against this backdrop, uh, Dr. Dan, how do you respond to calls for an ease in restrictions amid the spread of Omicron given its relatively mild symptoms? Well, I would agree with uh, what Professor Kim has said that uh, Omicron is much more transmissible. And even if it causes less severe disease overall than the Delta variant, if we ease measures now, we run the risk of a huge increase in new cases, uh, strain on hospital systems, and we haven't really talked about uh, the potential risk of long haul COVID with the Omicron variant. I think this is an unanswered question, but if long haul COVID can occur after infection with the Omicron variant, if we have a huge increase in patients with Omicron, we can expect 10 to 20% of these people will then go on to suffer from long haul COVID for months. And I, don't think that this is a risk that we should take. Uh, so this is not the time to ease measures. Uh, and that's what the WHO has said uh, in their most recent risk assessment. They said the global risk assessment due to the Omicron variant is very high. This is not the time to ease restrictions. Uh, the opposite is true, that we should be increasing the stringency of infection, protect, uh, infection prevention and control measures. We should increase testing and surveillance. We need to prepare for uh, hospital surge capacity. Uh, and that's the direction that we need to go in, not easing of measures. 
Right. Meanwhile, Dr. Beldavac in Spain, amid the challenges faced by medical experts or authorities there in the country, I understand the government itself, like uh, its counterparts in quite a number of other countries, have shortened the isolation period of COVID-19 patients to seven days. What prompted this move and what are your thoughts on the matter? I was involved in this decision. So, uh, however, we need to clarify, this decision only affects people who had not had symptom. This is this is the, the, the key point. And if you have no symptoms for seven days after a positive test, uh, you can go out. This is the this is the this is the, the key this is the key of this decision. So this is because the current incubation period is known to be shorter and probably even less than five days in any case. The decision must be adapted to the evolution of the characteristic of the virus. We, 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 we must also remain alert to modify them if we observe a new modification in the incubation uh, period. But the key is that this decision only affects people who haven't had symptoms for seven days. Right, so we're talking about asymptomatic COVID-19 patients. Their isolation period has been reduced to seven days. Yeah. Right, I see. Meanwhile, Dr. Kim, some pundits claim the presence of vaccines has allowed for fewer cases of severe illness and fatalities, even amid the rampant spread of Omicron. Do you share this view? Well, I uh, agree with the, uh, the, the uh, agree with the, uh, the those opinion, and then the, this is actually just uh, uh, thanks to the as uh, a very efficient just uh, vaccine effic efficacy right now, and then well somehow I have to just uh, disting distinguish uh, maybe maybe and actually people are actually just confused about the uh, some uh, vaccine efficacy, and then we are actually talking about just. Uh, here in the vaccines, because in terms of uh, preventing the diseases, the severe disease, not the as uh, preventing this infection itself, and uh, most of the uh, some uh, uh, the primary endpoint of the phase three clinical trials of uh, most of the, the vaccines is actually just uh, preventing the disease and this preventing whether it's a mild disease or severe disease. When we actually just uh, endpoint is uh, the severe disease, it's just the uh, vaccine efficacy is way more than the 90%. But then if we're just uh, talking about the infection, well, sometimes we are actually talking about very, the very this is very high, but if we, if we just uh, aim for like a sterilizing immunity, I think yeah, just the current just the vaccines do not actually confer the sterilizing immunity. Maybe just the, at just the early after this vaccination, when our just the antibody response, especially just the neutralizing uh, antibody level is very high, that might just uh, just confer the some uh, sterilizing immunity very short or the very short period of time. But then in the end, the, uh, the, this neutralizing antibody is actually just a decrease over time. So that's why we are actually just observing just a breakthrough infection. And uh, this is not quite uh, surprising. We actually just predicted this kind of thing just would happen. But then the good thing is that uh, the severe disease is actually very effectively just prevented by just the vaccines. And then the, even still just after six months after vaccination, so, uh, uh, technically speaking, the, the T cell response, this is uh, immunity, immune response conferred by the uh, immune cells. This is very, just still very just uh, strong. And then this, uh, uh, this uh, T cell response is also, uh, as of now, is not less affected by the appearance of uh, many just variants. The neutralizing antibody itself is uh, very much uh, substantially can affected by the uh, some specific mutations found in the some specific uh, variant. For example, like a beta variant, and then now Omicron variant. The neutralizing efficacy is uh, substantially decreased, but T cell response is just uh, still very just good. And then T cell response that. Uh, sort of just uh, uh, the reason of the spike, the spike protein where the uh, T cell response can detect is uh, much more just broad compared to the, uh, some, uh, the epitope just the, the detected by the uh, some, uh, neutralizing antibody. I see. Yeah. Moving forward, um, Dr. Dan, over in Australia, there appears to be quite a bit of talk over the definition of a close contact of COVID-19. Now, the Prime Minister there, Scott Morrison, says, and I quote, a close contact is someone who shares a living space with a confirmed patient or someone who spent four hours with a COVID-19 patient within a similar setting, like at a residential care centre. What are your thoughts on this definition and its potential implications on containment efforts? Right. Well, we need to understand what the background is for uh, that caused this change in the definition. And basically in Australia, like in other countries, the problem is that the Omicron variant has caused such an increase 
in uh, cases and also probable cases that people are standing in our in lines for hours trying to get a test. And basically uh, the demand for testing has surpassed the testing resources available. The problem is when you change this definition and limit the uh, definition of, of, of a, a close contact, just people who have been uh, in the same household for four hours with someone who tested positive on a PCR test, uh, you run the risk of missing a lot of uh, cases uh, of COVID-19. And so I would agree with the opinion of the president of the Australian Medical Association that this uh, decision will only accelerate uh, the spread of the virus in the country. What is a better solution is to improve the infrastructure for testing, to increase manpower and the machines that are available for PCR testing, to automate the results, uh, and to get the results out faster to people so that they could know if they are PCR negative or PCR positive. Because of course, if you uh, let a person know that they are PCR positive, three to four days after they've received the test, you've gone beyond the window of infectivity. Uh, so basically it's, it's moot. And so uh, I, I don't think it was a wise decision. Right. Dr. Belder, you were part of a study earlier on, 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 on something that showed stronger immunity is generated after a first dose of uh, AstraZeneca and a second dose of Pfizer. What do you suppose has been the impact of this method of vaccination, perhaps, in fighting Omicron? Okay, the data that currently available to, to, to us is that this combination schedule has are generating uh, an immunity that could uh, counteract the Omicron, the Omicron variant. However, uh, these, uh, these uh, people should be boosted. In addition, uh, the most important, the most important finding for this is that the flexibility associated with this type of schedule has allowed the health authorities to administer the third doses without worrying about the initial vaccination schedule that people had received. In any case, um, we need uh, we need to boost our in the our, the, the, the volunteers that join this clinical trial because their uh, immunity last long, however, is decreasing all over the time. Right. Having said that, Dr. Belder, what are your thoughts on offering booster shots to those as young as perhaps five years old? It's an excellent question. Excellent. Yeah. For, for now, I have no, no answer for this question, sorry. I see. So you have reservations about it then, could we assume? Or you have to think about it some more? No, no, no reservation. Um, in this regard, we are starting to vaccinate the first doses for uh, the children from five years to twelve years, and in this regard, thinking about the future, about new new schedule to administer to the, to our children, it's very difficult for me to 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 uh, to, to predict. So, uh, so but it's not a reservation. It's only uh, that we are now we are now in this uh, in in a specific moment of the time. So. First, uh, the first schedule for the children. And then in the future, we will think about it. Right, that is a good point. All right, moving ahead, Dr. Kim, back here in the country, what are your thoughts on including clinics nationwide in efforts to treat COVID-19 patients? Well, I understand this as uh, just, a, just a kind of just a at-home tre treatment, or just part of the at-home treatment option. And then I think uh, the situation has a little bit just uh, changed over the just the last uh, some several weeks. And the first one is now oral drugs are now just uh, really available soon. And then we have also monoclonal antibodies. And then with that, uh, also maybe just some rapid antigen test will be very necessary for the before just uh, using the, those kind of uh, some, uh, uh, the drugs option. And then the, uh, I think uh, for this uh, some clinic level, just the things, I think as an in-person just uh, uh, medicine is not still just available because of some uh, very contagion, contagion is of this, uh, the, this disease. So I think maybe some telemedicine would be just one of the option. And then the, and I think uh, uh, so telemedicine would be one option. And then the part of the telemedicine is just still just actually just uh, being done right now with the, uh, some of the uh, some doctors and the patient, but mostly some uh, specialized, uh, just, uh, the doctor like uh, some infectious disease specialized. So it will be just uh, expanded like this. 
Right. And Dr. Dan, very briefly speaking, what are your thoughts on calls here in the country or intentions by the government here to sh mark a shift in its COVID-19 strategy in light of the presence of Omicron? Uh, so in terms of what we need to do right now, um, we asked to ask two questions. Are we ready for Omicron and what can we do better? Uh, Right now, there are 7 million Koreans who have not received even one dose of a COVID-19 vaccine. 3 million are eligible, 4 million are not. So we need to do a better job with uh, campaigning to try to get the unvaccinated vaccinated. Uh, we also have, um, I think, 11 million people who received two doses of an AstraZeneca vaccine. We need to make sure that we target them in terms of making sure they have access to a booster because uh, they are not ready for uh, Omicron uh, when it comes. And then in terms of uh, treatment options, uh, it's now known that most of the monoclonal antibody treatments uh, that were previously used to fight COVID-19, they don't work against Omicron. And that includes the Celtrion uh, monoclonal antibody, Regtavivab. Uh, so trovimab, on the other hand, has been shown to retain its neutralization activity against Omicron. So I think we need to start a conversation with GSK uh, and get doses of trovimab in our country to prepare. Uh, I don't think we've moved enough on this. Also, Paxlovid, we have secured doses of Paxlovid, but it will be a very difficult medication to prescribe as an outpatient. There are 83 medications that have drug-to-drug uh, -drug interactions with Paxlovid. Uh, it can cause uh, hepatitis and jaundice. Um, it, it, it's going to be difficult. So we need to get clinical guidelines that are safe, effective, and feasible for how we use Paxlovid in our country for right. when the medication does get available. So right. these are some of uh, suggestions. Right, they are. Dr. Belden, we have like 10 seconds. What are your thoughts on ways to perhaps better contain the pandemic across the globe amid the presence of Omicron? The most important thing is to maintain the molecular surveillance system that I have loved us to identify this new type of variant. For the moment, the spectral arrival of vaccine, this argument against the, this new variant is the best strategy together with the social distance measures. Thank I you. See. All right, Dr. Belder, thank you very much for the correct answer. Dr. Dan, as always, thank you for your thoughts. And Dr. Kim here in the studio, thank you for being with us today. Right, and on that note, we say goodbye. We'll be back with more coverage tomorrow. That will be Thursday. Join us then. Thank you for now.